So uh, good evening again. Uh, if you just joined us, uh, you're at the right place because today we're gonna talk all about irony and outrage uh, in our political uh, landscape. Uh, this is the, I think, fourth uh, presentation this uh, year about misinformation and disinformation. We had a really good series and run. We have another, uh, another event coming uh, next week. Um, and uh, I just mentioned, but if you didn't hear it, uh, if you're around the Lindemann Library, uh, please stop by. Uh, there is a special collections exhibit about dictionaries and their usage um, in curriculum and as a reference material in history and currently. So uh, stop by and uh, you're welcome to do that. Um, on um, the 31st uh, this month, we're gonna celebrate uh, Trans Day uh, in the virtual Martin Day Library. So at six o'clock, we're gonna have an opening for an exhibit uh, there uh, in the grind area and around it. So uh, please join us to that event. Uh, I think that exhibit is gonna be put together and set there uh, tomorrow. Uh, and beyond that, we're gonna have lots of events for Poetry Month uh, that is uh, uh, in April. Uh, and we're going to be uh, telling you all about them because there are too many to mention, but they're all in excellent quality. <laughs> so uh, there, yeah, please, please stay tuned. Uh, we have a lot uh, going on there. Um, and uh, the one that we have next week, so this is Wednesday, April 6th, uh, is called Who Decided to Commemorate the Walking Purchase and Why, uh, 1920. 1920s fanfare and local opposition. Uh, and this is again, uh, part of the series about misinformation and disinformation, uh, very local and uh, interesting topic. Uh, so uh, please stay tuned. I hope you got a note about it from us. And if not, then uh, let us know uh, and you're invited to it as well. So uh, this event is recorded. Uh, I'm gonna be uh, uh, reading the questions in the end of it. So as I said, you know, send us your uh, questions ahead of time. And now to the main event. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna be talking uh, about irony and outrage and the landscape of rage, fear and laughter uh, in the US. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, there is a book, it's awesome check it out. <laughs> uh, it, uh, it's a really cool topic. And like I, I just said to Dr. Donegal, that kind of it's interesting how it's global, because it's not just be uh, here in the States that there are some differentiations around taste uh, and uh, party uh, focus uh, around those things. Uh, so uh, what uh, I'm going to now uh, say who, who she is. So uh, uh, she studies the content, audience, and effects of non-traditional political information. She has published over 40 academic articles and book chapters on the content, uh, psychology, appeal, and effects of political information, satire, and misinformation. Uh, her book, Irony and Outrage, examines satire and outrage as the logical extensions of the respective psychological profiles of liberals and conservatives. Uh, her current book, Projects Wrong, how identity fuels misinformation and how to fix it is under development with uh, Johns uh, Hopkins University. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Uh, Donegal, thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that nice intro. Um, yeah, so this, the talk that I'm gonna be giving um, tonight, oh, I need to be able to share my screen. It says I can't. Is there a way to fix that? We're going to put our best people on it. OK, uh, so let me just talk for a second while that is uh, enabled for me. Um, I have been for 20 years studying political satire and the psychology of humor. More recently, oh, there we are. OK, more recently, Here we go. I have been studying. There, you should be able to see that now. We're good? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, more recently, I have been studying a different kind of fake news, and that is um, misinformation and disinformation. So the project I'm gonna talk to you about tonight is about um, my sort of journey 
understanding political satire and finally trying to figure out the answer to the question, why is political satire predominantly liberal? Um, and some other questions that sort of fell from that. But the work that I'm doing now is on the psychology of misinformation and why it is that we as humans are so often wrong and why it is that we are drawn to information that is incorrect. What are the motivations for that? And also how our media and political environments exploit that in ways that are really harmful for democracy. Um, so that book, Wrong, is, well, I'm literally halfway done it and it will be done by August 1st. So keep your eye out for that. Um, I am, let me, first, let me just give you sort of a roadmap of where we are heading here tonight. Um, first are some big questions. The big question really, first of all, does satire have a liberal bias, right? So Trevor Noah, Stephen Colbert, it seems like that's true, is that true? And on a related note, does political opinion talk, right? Like especially the talk shows you hear on, on the radio, so talk radio, does this genre have a conservative bias? I'm gonna talk about how both liberal satire and conservative outrage have parallel functions and effects for their audiences. I'll talk about historical context, that is what are the political conditions and the technological and economic conditions that sort of brought about these two genres at the same, almost the same exact time, which I think is fascinating. We'll talk about why it is, the case that I make as to why these look so different, but do similar things for their audiences. It has to do with the psychology of liberals and conservatives, specifically the role of threat. So I'll be talking a lot about political psychology and research on political psychology. I'll talk about how these two aesthetic forms, how satire on the one hand and outrage on the other serve certain purposes for liberals and conservatives respectively. They are, as I argued, the logical extensions of the proclivities and the psychological profiles of liberals and conservatives. And we'll talk a little bit about the implications of this for what happens to the viewers of these shows in terms of, are they persuaded? Are there agendas set by these shows? Are they mobilized by these shows? And what does this mean for COVID in particular? Uh, COVID is an interesting case. And I just want to, even though I don't do it in the book, I think that we need to talk about it because it has been brought up a lot in the context of my book. And I, I would like to address that. So the first question, does satire have a liberal bias? This is the question that I was asked for years whenever I would present my research on the effects of exposure to late night comedy. So I have been studying this since Letterman and Leno, and I have done experiments and surveys, and I would present these findings, and inevitably someone would raise their hand and say, why is it that all these shows tend to lean to the left? And I never really had a great answer, and that's, which is why I then explored it for this book. But I wasn't the only one asking this question. Lots of media outlets ask this question with some of my favorite headlines, including why conservative comedy doesn't work and never will, or why does every conservative daily show fail? Why can't right-wing comics break into US late night TV? And Washington Monthly put it really bluntly when they said, why aren't conservatives funny? Fair, we'll see. So the question then on the other side is, is it fair to say that political opinion talk shows have a conservative bias? And that also is not a question that I alone have been asking. Forbes magazine says, why are all the talk radio stars conservative? The death of Air America, which was the liberal attempt at a talk radio network. And this, the argument is liberals fail at talk radio. How conservatives dominate TV radio talk and how to rescue liberal talk radio. So there's kind of a cultural understanding that talk radio and this particular genre of talk radio is the domain of conservatives and satire, political satire is the domain of liberals. 
And when I talk specifically about the political opinion talk genre, I refer to it as outrage, which I will explain why and how. But the book that I base this on is by Jeff Berry and Sarah Soberai, who years ago came up with a typology to define what outrage programming is. And outrage programming, according to their definition, is programming that has a single host, is driven by the opinions and perspectives of that host. It does not try to present any information in a balanced way. It does it in a threat-oriented, didactic way, telling their viewers, here are the threats, here's what to do about it, here are the enemies, here are the targets, and it is morally serious. Okay, so that is the outrage program genre. Now, um, when you think about this, you can think of the late Rush Limbaugh, Right now, we have Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity that fit this mold, Laura Ingram, Fox, um, some of the One America Network programs. But also, in this category, we also do put Rachel Maddow or uh, Lawrence O'Donnell, who are the liberal MSNBC hosts. What's important, though, and as I will explain, the, sh the hosts of those shows do that genre a little bit differently then the Fox hosts, then the Rush Limbaugh. Um, in fact, the book here, Outra The Outrage Industry, um, Barry and Silver, I figured out through a content analysis that yeah, both liberals and conservatives have outrage shows, but the outrage on the right is far more profitable, far more popular, and far more outrageous in terms of the content elements that make it outrage. That is threats and targets and slippery slope language and hyperbole. Um, so I just, that to me really started getting me thinking, maybe the question isn't just about why is satire liberal? Maybe the question is why are the two sides drawn to articulate or express their political views through these vastly different aesthetic forms? Now they are vastly different, but there have been, I'd say at this point, decades of research indicating that the effects of viewing these shows are quite parallel for their audiences. Whether you are a liberal watching Trevor Noah, Stephen Colbert, or a conservative watching Hannity or Laura Ingram, you come away with more information, more knowledge. Now, you're not necessarily going to get knowledge that is objective knowledge. You are going to learn information that serves your political side, okay? So uh, actually uh, Kathleen Hall Jameson and Joe Capella refer to this as balkanized knowledge. So it's not like you're learning all the things, you're learning just the things that are good for your team. And this is true on both sides. We also find agenda setting effects. That is whatever it is that the hosts of these shows talk about end up being on the top of the audience's agenda. So when Trevor Noah talks about, well, the other night Trevor Noah was talking about Kanye West and Kim Kardashian. Guess what? Just by virtue of the fact that he's talking about that, his viewers are gonna think that that's an important issue. Uh, sometimes he talks about Ukraine. Sometimes he talks about COVID. Whatever it is he's talking a lot about, gets on the top of our minds and we think it's important. The same is true of Hannity, Tucker Carlson, et cetera. What they are talking about is deemed important by their viewers. So right now, if you're watching Fox, that probably is issues related to um, whether it is questions about the transgender athletes, perhaps, other culture war questions, right? Questions about, um, race or the uh, Supreme Court nominee, critical race theory. These are the issues that they're talking about on Fox. So those are on the top of the mind of the people watching them. Um, this, All these um, effects are related to priming, which is simply ideas that are brought to the top of our mind recently or frequently. These are the things that we are thinking more about. And these are the things that are gonna then shape other decisions that we make. So maybe decisions about who to vote for or you know, what issues are really important. Viewers of both of these kinds of shows talk about politics more. 
So it, these shows affect political discussion in part because they give you sort of fodder. They give you raw material. So you can talk about things at the water cooler with your friends or, or on the job. People who watch these shows are more likely to participate in politics and they're more interested in politics, unsurprising. And we also find that people who watch these shows have what's called high internal efficacy. Efficacy simply means my confidence that I have the ability to engage in the political process. Now, efficacy is hugely important because it's like a linchpin between information and action. So people who are high in efficacy, they have that necessarily, like, that like I can do it spirit. And that often explains why we see the higher participation among these kinds of viewers. And finally, and this I think is fascinating, viewers of both genres show lower trust in government and lower trust in media, especially for the um, outrage, conservative outrage genre. But both of these genres are associated with lower trust in government, okay? What's important is that many of these effects and many of these sort of associations are correlational. So we're, it's not totally clear for some of these which comes first. Is it that the people who are more interested in politics then seek out these shows or is it the other way around? Now, for some of these, we have isolated the causality. We know that watching these shows increases knowledge, sets people's agendas, primes things, increases political discussion, um, it, some of the questions on the right here with interest, efficacy, and trust, it's not quite clear which comes first. Um, okay, so let's start getting into a deep dive of the history here. How did this happen? Why did this happen? Why are we so bifurcated in these two spaces? In 1996, it was a magical year. <laughs> it was the birth of both The Daily Show and Fox News, three months apart. And you have to ask yourself, is that an accident? And I will explain to you, no, that is not an accident. Um, it was not a great conspiracy, but they're both outcomes of the same underlying factors. So on the one hand, this is a young Bill O'Reilly. Bill O'Reilly's show was on Fox, on the Fox News channel from the moment that the Fox News channel launched. Here we have Craig Kilborn, who was the original host of The Daily Show. Now, Importantly, the template for that show, which is a fake news show where they interview people on the streets and they make fun of politics and they make fun of the genre of cable news, that was established when he first started the show in 1996. In 1999, John Stewart took over the show and really increased the political bend of that show. John Stewart, um, who many of you probably remember, as the host of that show, especially during the um, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, I think that that's when his viewership really increased. He brought on the former head editor of the satirical news magazine, The Onion, who at the time was Ben Carlin, who also had a strong political point of view. He had been at the University of Wisconsin and they together really honed the political perspective of that show. So it wasn't just like a goofy news parody. They had an ideological, they say they didn't, okay? But they did, they clearly had a political point of view, um, as does and did Bill O'Reilly. So why is it that these two shows launched just three months apart? And no, they were not in cahoots with one another. I argue that it is because of the political and journalistic context that had kind of rolled out in the 80s and 90s. And this is like, I mean, I could teach an entire course. I do teach an entire course on this one slide, but I'm just gonna do this in like two minutes. So hold on to your hats. The first is in the 1980s under the Reagan administration, there were lots of efforts of deregulation, right? So you may be familiar with this, deregulating um, the airline industry and various uh, um, fuel industries. There was also a lot of attention paid to the deregulation of media industries. And that deregulation extended into the 1990s under President Clinton. Deregulation in this context means that there are fewer 
rules governing the activities of media corporations. There are no longer rules about the size of a media conglomerate. So it used to be that there were limits to the number of holdings that a particular company could have in media. Those limits disappeared. Um, as a result of these changes, with also the elimination of the Fairness Doctrine, which many of you are probably familiar with, which in 1987, the Fairness Doctrine was eliminated. And that had literally said that if you are a broadcast network and you pay attention to one side of an argument, you also have to give the other side um, a fair opportunity to respond. That was eliminated in 1987. Um, and was followed almost immediately by Rush Limbaugh um, creating a, a sort of franchise out of his show around the country because he knew he had a good thing and he knew he could do it especially well without the rules of the Fairness Doctrine. So what happens when media industries are deregulated is that there's a huge opportunity for profit because if you are able to grow your media conglomerates and get all kinds of media industries under one roof, like hypothetically, Disney, you are able to then capitalize on economies of scale, increase your profits exponentially by eliminating redundancy in the company. I mean, this is like economics 101, right? So as a result, these media corporations recognized that news was a really potentially profitable product, especially local news, and that then kind of trickled down to other news organizations. And it was like, you know what? We used to protect you from demands for profit, but no more. We, show us the money. We need to see the money. Well, what happens when news organizations are required to make a profit? They shift their focus. They shift from what the public needs to what the public wants. And not even the public to what viewers want. It changes news into sensationalized, dramatized, fragmented, personal. It also really changes sort of the, the opportunity for people to take their time and think through issues, especially television news. So at that same time, we witness then reduced trust in news, also potentially associated with some of these changes in the structures of news at that time. We also witness reduced trust in government. And this was a spillover from the 70s as well. Remember, we are now operating in, in an era of uh, post-Watergate, post-Vietnam, where authorities are not to be trusted. So as that sort of unfolds, you have this, this sort of precipitous decline in trust in government. All the while, we have, especially starting in 1994, with, you may recall, um, contract with America. Newt Gingrich was the Speaker of the House. He encouraged all the Republican Congress people who were running for office to promise to cut spending and create a contract with America. The Republicans swept the House, swept the Senate, and it is considered the Republican Revolution. Now, that then kind of put the flag in the sand for the Republican Party, that they were going to be more ideological in their in the legislation that they passed and in the legislation that they blocked. Democrats respond in kind, and over time, we witness the polarization of the two political parties farther and farther away from each other at the level of elites, followed by polarization of American people, us, farther and farther away from each other on these matters as well. This sounds bad, it is. At the same time, that that's all the backdrop. We have changes that are occurring in media technologies that have huge implications. First, you have the, the, the sort of umbrella concept is media fragmentation. So what is media fragmentation? Media fragmentation is the notion that with cable technologies, with the internet, there's, I mean, the specific term is a gazillion. There's a gazillion channels. There's a gazillion outlets. As every single outlet emerges, it changes the, the economics 
of how this programming is going to be done. Um, my favorite book on this is Joe Turo's Breaking Up America because he tells the story so clearly. He basically explains that because the model for media in the United States is through the purchase of audiences by advertisers, right? So advertisers are paying outlets for access to audiences. If you are no longer able to say, hey, you can pay a whole lot of money because I have this giant audience that basically represents a third of the whole population, which is what they could say in the 80s when people were watching ABC. Now the question is, how are you going to make it desirable for an advertiser to want to purchase an audience that's tiny? The answer is you make custom niche content that's going to appeal to a certain kind of consumer so that you can say to advertisers, look, I don't have the biggest audience, but I have this tiny homogenous audience that has a particular kind of interest. And yeah, you might not get a huge bang for your buck in terms of like size of the audience, but you might be able to advertise to exactly who you want. And that then was the driving force behind the cultivation of tiny little networks from HGTV to um, arts and entertainment television, to MTV, to Spike TV, to Comedy Central, which it turned out, oh, let me go back. Comedy Central was a fascinating example because Comedy Central seemed to attract the coveted demographic that no one could find in the 90s and early 2000s. And you might be saying, who is that? The answer is young males, young, knowledgeable, politically interested men. Where were they? They were watching The Daily Show. Voila. Okay, so let's dive deep into what political satire is here. So as a result of all of those big changes that we saw historically and politically, as a result of these sort of um, changing media technologies. You have low trust, you have polarization, you have people who are more entrenched in their views, probably harder to please in terms of the kind of public affairs information they're gonna get. There's a real demand for different forms of political information. And so the creators of media content respond with satire and outrage. So, Satire is a kind of humor that takes aim at a, at a target, it advances an argument, and it advances an argument usually critical of the, of the press, critical of government. And it, honestly, it, it typically does this through juxtapositions that are ironic. Um, irony is when you say the opposite of what you mean. So like today, it's really rainy down here outside of Philadelphia where I am, and I you know, might say, wow, what great weather we're having. Well, you know, looking at the weather, I don't mean it's great weather. I mean, it's terrible weather, right? Irony, you have to do some somersaults in your mind to reconcile the intended meaning with the literal meaning, okay? So that, that is the, the vehicle that a lot of, of satire uses. It is characterized by kind of experimentation and play and, it's never totally clear what it means because a lot of times irony is, if you're saying the opposite of what you mean, you can always engage in plausible deniability and say, oh, but I never said that. Well, so, so I just inferred it from what you said. It's ambiguous. It never tells you exactly what it's telling you. It's left up to the audience to decide what it means. Uh, we'll, I'll show you a couple examples because it is really fun and fascinating how, how we unpack it. On the other hand, it's a very different kind of programming, and that is outreach programming, political opinion talk. Here, we are not dealing in any way with ambiguity. We're not dealing with irony. We're not dealing with play. We're not dealing with experimentation. This is as I said earlier, it is didactic. It tells you exactly what you need to think. It tells you exactly what to worry about. It typically engages in these hyperbolic arguments. So overstating problems, slippery slope language, like 
if this happens, the whole world will be on fire, that kind of stuff. Um, and it's always focused on the identification of threats, usually in the form of outgroups and political leaders and other kinds of cultural elites. So groups of people, political leaders and um, elites in culture. Okay. So why is it that we have liberals gravitating towards content that is silly and ironic and liberal creators gravitating towards the creation of content that's silly and ironic? Well, we have conservatives gra gravitating towards content that is didactic and threat oriented and conservative creators creating the content that is didactic and threat oriented. What is going on? And as my examples here, Stephen Colbert, probably the best example of ironic satire was his show. Uh, before he was the host of The Late Show, he hosted The Colbert Report, where he was entirely performing in an ironic conservative persona in the style of Bill O'Reilly. Everything he said you needed to untangle and recognize he meant the opposite of what he said. And here he has no pants, which is funny. Then the difference here, a Sean Hannity um, image, right? Where he looks stern, he's you know trying to identify some threat for you and he's highlighting in scary font, the tactics of the left that are being used against you to sabotage you in some way. Why do these look and feel so different? To answer this question, we need to turn to political psychology. Uh, these are four books I would highly recommend. If you haven't read them, I can drop them in the chat after if you're interested. They are uh, Jonathan Haidt, uh, George Lakoff. These are um, political psychologists, Smith, Hibbing, and Alford, and Mark Hetherington and Jonathan Wheeler, Prius or Pickup talking about the very different psychological profiles of liberals and conservatives. I can't tell you everything that's in these books. The books are amazing, but I will boil it down to one word. The difference between liberals and conservatives has to do with how we monitor for and think about interpersonal physical threat. That's key, interpersonal physical threat. Some people are high threat monitors, Okay, they are very cautious about their environment. They always have in their mind that somebody might be lurking around the corner. For those people, it is really it's imperative that they make decisions quickly, that they avoid uncertainty, that they find situations that are predictable, because when situations are certain and predictable, you can minimize threat. That changes how they engage with their worlds. They operate based on cognitive shortcuts to make decisions super fast. They are high in need for closure, which means they do not like the uncertainty and ambiguity. They want to know what is happening. They want it now. Um, what's the other one? I think I said that. So they, they generally make decisions based on intuition, gut, and simple cues that tell them efficiently what is the correct action to take. On the other hand, if you are less attuned to threat in your environment, well, what a luxurious place to live because you're just kind of in la la land going through your life. It is a luxury because you then don't have to always be thinking about what is lurking around the corner. As a result, you can chew your cud and take your time and think about everything there is to think about before you make a decision. If you're not worried about the imminent threat, you then can perseverate contemplate, daydream. It also means that you might not have that sort of moral seriousness that might accompany someone who is really concerned about phys physical threats. I, by, and is this stereotyping? Yes, that is what psychology does. Speaking of stereotypes, here are the stereotypes that I have created to illustrate what life is like for an individual who is high in these two traits that I'm talking about. If you are high in tolerance for ambiguity, you're not a high threat monitor, okay? You don't worry about what's lurking around the corner. So therefore, you also are high in need for cognition because you like thinking about things that are complex because you don't need to rush your decisions. You can think for as long as you want. For you, 
Life is like a Chuck E. Cheese playground, right? It's safe, padded floor, all kinds of fun things to explore. Everything's about experimentation. There's not a, a strict purpose and there's certainly not a moral seriousness to what you're doing. If on the other hand, you perceive threat in your world and you're always looking for it, you're going to be low in tolerance for ambiguity and low in need for cognition. This doesn't mean you are stupid because that's not what need for cognition is. Need for cognition is enjoyment of thinking and perseverating and contemplating. So if you are low in need for cognition, it just means you are someone who uses shortcuts to come to decisions quickly and efficiently, usually based on emotions and cues. I think of life for these folks like this, okay? They, for them, because they perceive that they're imminent threats, they're all about making decisions as quickly as possible. There's no room for play, there's no room for jokes. Okay, how are these associated with political ideology? Well, first let's think about, let's map it out a little bit to think about where these two traits come from, right? We just talked about how, yes, it comes from the extent to which you're monitoring for threats in your world, right? The extent to which you might be thinking of your own mortality. These things are associated with these traits. So I'm not threat monitoring. I don't think about my own death very much. If that's me, I get to have high tolerance for ambiguity and high need for cognition. These factors come from nature and nurture, obviously, nice combo biology, physiology, even genetics. There is evidence that these are genetically tied and environmental factors. So if you are you know, growing up somewhere where there really is imminent threat, you are going to have a higher mort mortality salience. You are going to be a high threat monitor, okay? So what does this have to do with politics? Think about what happens when you are high in tolerance for ambiguity and high in need for cognition. It is probably going to shape, as I mentioned, your information processing goals and how you come to know the things you know or epistemology. If I am high in tolerance for ambiguity, high in need for cognition, I like to ruminate. I like to look for all the information, weigh my options, reevaluate my position in light of new evidence. I can change my mind a thousand times if I want because there's no threat lurking. If on the other hand, it is the case that I'm low in tolerance for ambiguity, low in need for cognition, then my processing goals are about efficiency, right? What happens here is that you find that these processing goals contribute to a couple different things. One, if you are a high threat monitor, you need certainty in your life and you're concerned about threats in your world, that is going to tend to result in more conservative political attitudes, beliefs, and values. Conservative, especially, by the way, in these cultural issues, not so much fiscal policy. So a lot of times what we're talking about here is political beliefs on issues related to gender, sexuality, race, crime, those things where interpersonal physical threat might loom large, okay? So not like taxes, for example. Um, these same things are associated with aesthetic preferences. What? If you are very high in tolerance for ambiguity, if you're high in need for cognition, you are going to like very different kinds of art and music than people who are lower in these traits. And I will show you some amazing examples of this. So just to be clear, the, the kinds of ideology that we're talking about, again, we're talking about issues related to race, sexuality, gender, um, crime, immigration, all of these kinds of issues, okay? Like I said, the cultural issues. If you are liberal on these issues, you will tend to be higher in tolerance for ambiguity and need for cognition. If you're conservative on these issues, you'll tend to be lower in those traits. And those traits are correlated with which of these paintings 
you would prefer. Truth. So there has been a lot of research on aesthetic preferences in their relation to both political views and psychological traits. And one of the strongest predictors of appreciation for abstract art is tolerance for ambiguity and need for cognition. If you are tolerant of ambiguity, you kind of love the fact that this kind of looks like a woman's face, but it's a little wacky, but you like the ambiguity of it and you like the sort of riddle solving of it, thinking like, what could Picasso possibly have meant here? Why did he put this here? Why did he put that there? As opposed to the realistic painting on the right. What research finds is that the people who really dislike Picasso's abstractions, part of that is driven by the fact that because they are low in tolerance for ambiguity, they just don't want to look at it. They're like, I don't get it. It's weird. I'm moving on. Okay. In addition, we find an association between these, as these psychological traits and appreciation for unsolved storylines. If you are high in tolerance for ambiguity and need for cognition, when a movie ends, and it's not clear what happens. It's like, well, does the couple get together or not? I don't know, you know, it's not clear. It could go either way. You're okay with that. You're like, oh, I get to kind of think about it and make it up in my mind. If you are, if you need closure and you are a heuristic thinker, which by the way, I need closure hugely. If, if that's you and you're watching one of those movies, you will hate it. Okay, that was the example of me. This movie is called Garden State. And at one point, I thought they weren't going to tell us if the couple got together at the end or not. I swore I was going to like leave the theater. Fortunately, they did end up telling us. Um, the other thing, what, what was the other piece of this that I was going to say? Oh, you know how at the end of movies, sometimes they'll say that last scene where it's like five years later, and then it shows like, oh, here's the couple and the babies. People like me who are high in need for closure, we love that. We wanna know the end of that story. Okay, so my argument in the book, and I offer a lot of data to back this up, is that ironic satire captures the liberal aesthetic. It is ambiguous, it is complex. It takes a lot of sort of mental effort and time to understand irony, it is horribly inefficient, okay? Now, comics would never think about themselves in terms of how efficient they are at communicating a message, right? But I think that that's, that's the ticket right there. They don't even think about efficiency because it's not about that. This, this is one of my favorite examples from Stephen Colbert. He says, now, I don't see color. People tell me I'm white, and I believe them because police officers call me sir. In order to understand this joke, you need to first read the beginning where he says, I don't see color, which is something that people say, right? They say, I don't see color. And then go on to read the next bit where he says, people tell me I'm white, I believe them. Well, why does he believe them? He believes them because police, office, police officers treat him with respect. Right. So he he discerns his race from the way that police officers treat him, which is implicitly acknowledging that racism exists. Now, do you go through this whole process step by step? No. But you kind of do in your mind unpacking it to get to the point where you recognize what he actually means is. It is probably ridiculous to claim you don't see color, right? So that's probably what he's actually saying. It is a lot of work. Now, it also, in addition to being a lot of work and inefficient, ironic satire does not in any way try to be serious, nor does it claim moral authority, okay? This is John Oliver making a joke about a jock strap, right? In addition, there is this inherent hybridity to what it's trying to do. Is John Oliver a journalist or is he a comedian, right? He blends these two genres. 
If I am high in need for closure, if I do not like ambiguity, I'm like, pick a lane, John Oliver, what are you? Are you a journalist? Are you a comedian? You might realize that this is similar to some of the conservative criticisms of athletes that speak out on politics, right? Stay in your lane. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be talking about this. My work is suggesting that that stems from the fact that these people that step out of their role, they are uh, violating their category, right? And if you, if you really need closure and fixed categories, that should be annoying to you, right? Stay in your lane. Uh, in addition, so on the other side, we have conservative outrage capturing the conservative aesthetic, right? I have a couple examples here. Um, this is, these are some quotes from Sean Hannity about after the Mueller report was, was, you know, presented and it was like Donald Trump was not guilty of collusion. Sean Hannity says, every American should be angry, outraged, and oh, no, no, I'm sorry, this is a different example. Sorry, this is um, right after the um, election in November of 2020, when we were in this in-between period, right, where we weren't exactly sure who was president because it hadn't been decided yet because so many people had voted by mail, et cetera. And Sean Hannity is saying we should, Every American should be angry, outraged, and worried, and concerned. We should have all these emotions, lots of emotions, about what happened in the election and the lead up to the election. You don't have to be a puzzle solver to understand what Sean Hannity is saying to you, right? He tells you exactly how to feel and exactly what to feel it about, okay? So unlike... John Oliver, who's like kind of a journalist, kind of a comic, never commits to either one, and he's goofy, but he's saying things that seem serious, but he's saying them in a playful way. If you are an outreach host, you are, you really are an entertainer, aren't you? Tucker Carlson, Laura Ingram, Sean Hannity, they are entertainers. Rush Limbaugh, wonderful, talented entertainer. However, they do everything they can to push that from your minds and instead to double down on their moral authority, that they're serious, right? That they're not just there to entertain you, right? They're not just there to do a song and dance. They're there saying important things. And they do that in service of their own moral authority. Okay. So I want to walk you through step-by-step step what this means, okay? If you have that liberal satire aesthetic interacting with a liberal audience member, right, whose brain is high in tolerance for ambiguity, high in need for cognition, what you'll find is, yes, you'll see increased attention to the issues they're talking about. You'll also see that it's going to contribute to this sort of unguided exploration on these issues. They're gonna think about them a lot, basically. And they might also engage in information seeking, learning about, learning more about those issues. That's something we see in a lot of these um, liberal satire audience members. On the other hand, if you take the aesthetic and content of a conservative outrage show, as it meets the mind of a conservative, a socially, culturally conservative viewer, high in need for closure, low in need for cognition, using heuristics and emotions, what you'll find is increased issue attention, yes, but you'll also find really intense emotional responses, usually negative emotional responses in response to outgroups and enemies, right? So a lot of anger. And that kind of emotional response is well-suited to mobilization. It helps fuel goal-driven mobilization. So I see these two genres as much as it seems like, you know, there's a lot of things they share, 
in terms of the knowledge and the interest and priming mm. and agenda setting, I think of them quite differently in terms of what they are capable of doing. I think of the satirist as sort of a, a wild untamed raccoon. Like once you put satire out there, it's no longer in your hands anymore as to what the audience is gonna do with it. Like it's not even in your hands as to how they're gonna make sense of it because it's ironic and it's not up to you anymore because you put it out there and now it's not yours, right? As opposed to didactic outrage, which I argue is like a well-trained attack dog. It is able to set out to do exactly what it wants to do and it can aim at a target and it can hit that target. And so as a result, as, as I was writing the book, um, it was around the same time that Sean Hannity and Judge Jean Pirro were um, campaigning with Donald Trump um, um, right before the midterm elections in 2018. And I was like, it's fascinating because it, they were using their platforms to serve as the well-trained attack dog. And Donald Trump could count on them to do that because they operated in service of his campaign so well. Um, it's just really fascinating. So after the book came out and we entered a global pandemic, which put my entire book tour on hold, uh, people were asking, well, why does it seem though, if conservatives are threat oriented, why aren't the Fox News hosts framing coronavirus as a bigger threat? And here I feel like there was such a missed opportunity. But first I gotta say, remember the kinds of threats that social and cultural conservatives are attuned to are not existential threats. They're interpersonal physical threats, right? from other people and other groups. That's what they are very good at responding to. COVID is weird. It's like, what is it? It's kind of in the air. It's kind of passed by people. Maybe you get it from your groceries. Like this was early on in 2020. Because of the existential nature of that threat, it did not serve that need as well. What did serve that need though, was that hosts like Sean Hannity and President Trump at the time talked about how Democrats were weaponizing the virus, that Democrats were taking advantage of the virus, right? They also talked about the virus as being um, China's fault. That allowed there to be a target attached to the virus, right? The virus is weird. We don't know what to do with that. We know what to do with the idea that like it's the China virus, which is what the president called it. We know what to do with the idea that, you know, the virus isn't that big of a deal. The other party is making it a big deal and using it cynically. That taps into that interpersonal intergroup threat. I feel like what a shame because had these conservative hosts taken advantage of the fact that they have viewers who are well poised to respond efficiently to threat, they would have been able to use their platform to very didactically say, here is what we need to do. If we all buckle down, we're, we can get through this. We can eradicate the virus and move on. Instead, they didn't. And we saw huge partisan gaps in uh, social distancing efforts. We still see gaps in vaccine uptake. We even, and this is the saddest part, we see huge partisan gaps increasingly in death rates. And if you think about the opportunity that was missed, I just feel like that was an opportunity to put our citizens who are most equipped to respond fiercely and ferociously to threat, we missed that opportunity to help eradicate this in a way across the board. Um, here's some other data showing these. You don't need to see the fine print. It shows partisan gaps. The red is Republicans, the blue is Democrats, and it's engaging in various behaviors during COVID. Um, I'm going to skip this one for now, but uh, let me just say my, my, 
the work that I'm doing now really is about how these tendencies are being exploited in ways that are harmful when actually having a need for closure and operating quickly based on heuristics, which is what our social and cultural conservatives will tend to do, those are exceptionally valuable traits. And what I'm concerned about is the way in which some of these traits are being exploited. I, I also, I mean, look, I have concerns about strong polarization in both directions. However, where I really see potentially destructive anti-democratic forces is in the, the sort of deliberate framing of information in ways to immediately mobilize folks who are ready to be mobilized. Um, and unfortunately, I think that we saw that on January 6th. So I, that is it. That is the end of my talk. And I can't wait to hear uh, questions or pushback or criticisms. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we have a few questions. I'm gonna uh, please keep on bringing them on and use the Q&A uh, button for that. Uh, so uh, one question that we have is about the role of repetition. Uh, so can you kind of expand on that? So like we have uh, other differences between the ways uh, by which the party comedians <laughs> or performers are using repetition and in what way is it impactful? Great question. So. Think about what repetition is, okay? How, how do we use repetition? Um, my friend Lisa Fazio is a psychologist and, and her work shows that even if people are exposed to something that is demonstrably false, if they hear it enough times, they will come to believe that it is true, okay? Why is that? Because in normal life, things that we hear a lot are true. In Think about that. In normal life, without the presence of exploitative forces, the things that we hear a lot will most often be true. As a result, our brains process repetition as a cue that facilitates recall. So when it comes to the, the question of repetition, folks who are making decisions based on heuristics, who are not engaging in analytical thought, who are not sort of unpacking things and, and getting in the weeds with it, they will come to remember things that have been repeated and be persuaded by things that have been repeated. Which, you know, quite frankly, if you watch some of the, the outrage shows or if you listen to them, there is an awful lot of repetition. And uh, I am convinced that they know exactly what they're doing, yeah. Thank you. Uh, William is asking, what do you make of comedians using the it's just a joke uh, response to perceived liberal ideology in a given joke bit? Uh, how does this fit with your sense of ambiguity as a driver for more uh, liberally aligned habits of mind? Yeah. Oh, it makes me crazy. It makes me, <laughs> it makes me bananas when they say that because I think it's disingenuous. Okay. Uh -huh. Now, recognize that the reason that they say that, though, is because in order for them to be operating in the state of play, they have to say that, right? Think about how different it would be if Trevor Noah, well, he does it a little bit. Let's think, think of how different it would be if um, someone like Jimmy Kimmel constantly like doubled down and said, oh, by the way, I really mean this. It would change his whole aesthetic, right? When I think about that when I think about comedians who become morally serious, I think of Dennis Miller, who was funny uh, and became more of an outrage host the more he became, um, the, the more he rejected the premise that it's just a joke, right? I also think of Bill Maher. Bill Maher, I feel like, especially over time, he's become more strident. He doesn't often sort of cloak himself in the, it's just a joke. Sometimes he's like, no, I really mean it. What are you gonna do about it? But that you lose something as a comedian when you operate in that space. I think it transforms what you're doing. 
Yeah, I, I, I hope that you mention his name because I was kind of I was curious what's going on with him uh, in the past uh, few years. Uh, there, there is a question about uh, cults and uh, yeah. uh, Robert is asking that we, we need boogeyman for cults. Yeah. Uh, and it always works to vilify, amplify and repeat, repeat. Um, so that that's that's right. Yeah, I'll just uh, just to yeah. um, build on that. Robert, the, uh, some of the work that I'm doing now is um, using social identity theory to understand misinformation. And a lot of what is driving what's going on in our media landscape is about these social allegiances that we have, um, the, how we feel like we're members of, of teams. Um, the literature on that really overlaps with the literature on uh, the psychology of cults. So that need to be a part of a group, the need to have a readily identifiable out group, those, that, those underlying dynamics are very much shared by both. So yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Kind of question I had, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit that I'm coming from a different culture uh, and uh, there is this, uh, th there used to be a time in Israel uh, when I grew up that, uh, you know, color TV was like the biggest threat uh, politically because, you know, like people were thinking about, oh, it's going to increase the divide, social divide, and, you know, like we don't need it. It's like frivolous. And mm -hmm. there was even a device that was uh, created to kind of counter the color uh, for for a little while uh, until you know the Knesset or the Parliament decided to kind of let it go. Uh, but wow. do you do you think you know like the role of technology, like how does it kind of play a role here? And like thinking about you know the social media and otherwise, but you know like there are like those tidbits that are picked up mm -hmm. right from those shows that kind of continue to circulate. Uh, and like maybe you could say something about the way. Sure. That, so I, because I'm a communication scholar, I do run the risk of being a media determinist, which, you know, people who think that everything is the result of media. Um, however, more and more, I see these as interactive forces that the media technologies have certain, what, what are called media affordances. So they have, they have certain things that they allow and or encourage and or like incentivize that interact with individual psychology, social dynamics, and sometimes even the, the broader political landscape. And you know, different media technologies are gonna interact in different ways based on what their affordances are. So if you are television, it's such a hyper-visual medium. And because of the nature of like a finite amount of time and space, it's all about speed, visual cues and emotions, right? And, and short snippets and decontextualized information. When we're talking about social media, some of the logics and affordances there are very different. It is decentralized. So now the audience is also a producer of information. It's horizontal. Individuals are empowered to communicate back to elites. It changes the entire power dynamic. And that fundamentally um, changes how that technology interacts with people. It even changes the way that people receive or interact with the very same clips that we used to watch on TV. So now you'll get on Facebook and you'll see a clip from John Oliver, but it's very different from consuming John Oliver on TV because now that clip was shared by your Aunt Susie who has put above it you have to see this. It is, you know, such a smart takedown of ba 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 ba. Now the message is not just John Oliver. The text that the that the audience member is receiving and interpreting is John Oliver times or multiplied by Aunt Susie's context that she's given. So it, it just, you know, it's complicated. Definitely. Uh, Maria is asking, do, do you think the hurtfulness of satire increases the outrage of the conservatives? And I guess it can work the other way around. I, so now I don't have empirical data to back this up. However, I do think that, I think 
that for some of the outrage hosts, I'm thinking specifically about Greg Gutfeld. I think that they want to be entertaining. I think they want to be funny. Greg Gutfeld, he has a late night show, okay? If you've seen it, it's not a late night show. It's an outrage show. He makes jokes, but they're not ironic jokes. They're like hyperbolic takedowns of liberals and of liberal media. It's an outrage show. So I do think that there's a little bit of resentment and spite that like everyone thinks they're so funny. <laughs> they're not that funny. I'm funny too. Um, I think that, I do think that there's some of that. I also think that, you know, in my work, I study sense of humor and there's like a 14 item test that measures sense of humor. And it's not just like, are you funny? It's, do you value humor? Do you use humor to cope? Do you use humor when you're with other people? Do you see humor as a mechanism that is to be valued in social interactions? And I remember looking at the scale and I was like, no one is going to strongly, you know, agree with this. And the statement was, people who tell jokes are a pain in the neck. I was like, no one is going to ever say strongly agree that, you know, comedians are a pain in the neck. Well, guess what? There were a lot of people who agreed strongly that comedians are a pain in the neck. And when I looked one by one to figure out who they were, they were people who were low in tolerance for ambiguity, and the vast majority of them were strong conservatives. And I was like, that's fascinating. So if you think about it, if you're driven by efficiency and survival, you might be like, it must be nice to be you, funny guy, nothing to worry about. You know, you must, it must be really nice to be you, just able to sit there and make jokes while the rest of us are actually trying to protect things. I think that then makes them feel, I think that they kind of have disdain, some, some. Um, yeah. Yep. <laughs> uh, something a little different. <laughs> uh, so Kevin is asking, um, it seems you're, uh, you've covered three emotions in your hypothesis. Uh, for conservatives, anger and fear, and uh, the liberals may be more happy mm -hmm. to engage in complex ideas. Uh, do you think liberals tend to focus on sad things and ruminate on them too because of the complexity of some problems? Yes, yes. I do. And I, yeah, no, uh, that's, that's a great point, Kevin. Yeah, I'm going to think this is the kind of question that I'm going to be thinking about for a while. It's a great question. Um, you know, I think when we look at the role that emotions play in information processing, sadness is actually an emotion that triggers more reflection and analytical thought. Um, so sadness is not a useful emotion for action. Um, whereas anger and fear are which makes sense, right? Uh, so I, I feel like that notion of, of sadness and the kind of cognitive processes that accompany with sadness are a lot more in line with a sort of liberal um, approach. Yeah, that's a great, that's great. I need, that's, I need to write that down. Let me write that down. Let me write that down. It's a good question. Go for it. Uh, it's recorded, you know? Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, so uh, th there is a question, and, and maybe, you know, like you can say something about the Ukrainian uh, situation now. You know, there's a lot of uh, commentary about the attitude of the government there in Russia uh, in general about, you know, trusting the media, trusting, uh, you know, the, the sort of facts that, you know, we are uh, sending their way. And like somehow it kind of feels like, you know, they are in that ironic uh, kind of frame of mind because yeah. 
the nothing they don't trust much. And at the same time, you know, like there is this obvious kind of very direct messaging uh, around, uh, you know, their actions and and everything else. So I kind of wonder if you have like a, a an opinion about, you know, the the Putin kind of situation and the way that he he's uh, translated in our own media uh, and, and the way that maybe it's pitched to us in the different news channels. That's interesting. So my when I think about this crisis that's unfolding, I'm often thinking a lot about how Putin is exhibits the profile of a, a classic um, socially conservative authoritarian. And, you know, this paternalistic, like, very serious model of like, you know, these, I, I think that he, he sort of perceives the Ukrainians as children who need to be protected. Um, I also think one of the things that I think is really wild is watching the, the propaganda that comes out of Ukraine, the pro-Ukrainian propaganda, which is playful and silly and tr like often uses these satirical approaches to make fun of the Russian army, right? Like, look, here's a farmer who's now in charge of the Russian army because he's pulling a tank behind him, you know? And part of me wonders how much of that is also informed by the fact that Zelensky was a comedian himself, which is such a wild thing to think about because he has undoubtedly the psychological characteristics of high tolerance for ambiguity and high need for cognition that are necessary to do improvisation and, and play and all of this. And yet he has found himself under conditions of imminent threat. I don't think that most of us thought that he would be alive right now, right? One month ago, I don't know that most of us thought that he would still be alive. And he has acted decisively. And so when you think about these traits and how they're exhibited, you, you really have to think about how context can change everything, right? Maybe the reason that we are exhibiting the traits that we're exhibiting is because of our social and, and societal context. I don't think that anyone would have thought that Zelensky would do what he's doing right now. Um, yeah, but I but when I look at the, you know, the authoritarian propaganda from the Kremlin, to me, it is very much the aesthetics of outrage, right? Thank you. Uh, Andrew uh, is asking, and I, I love this question, is it possible for there to be a successful conservative satirical show? Uh, or what would need to happen uh, in the political psychology for this to happen? And I'm kind of curious if we'll recognize it even, you know, like, <laughs> like uh, you know, maybe, maybe it's hard to decipher if it's successful. And well, he, here's, here's the question. Perhaps that's what Tucker Carlson is, right? I mean, and this is, this was what kind of blew my mind was I'm like, it's not funny, um, but perhaps that is what it looks like when you are when you have those aesthetic preferences and you express yourself in these ways. Um, I have a chapter in the book where I explore an example of a conservative attempt at The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, but it was like on Fox News and it was awful. And the reason it was awful was because there was a lack of understanding of the formula of joke construction. So usually with, with a joke, part of what's magical about jokes is that the argument is never made in the joke, okay? It's never made. The argument is made by the audience. So the idea that as the person telling the joke, you would actually give the argument, which is what a whole lot of the conservative jokes do. They're very much in the style of scalar humor, which is like the, you know, they, they call them yo mama so fat jokes where you say exactly what you mean first, right? Like, 
these liberals are such crybabies that blah, 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 blah. Now, notice that in that joke construction, the audience has no work to do. There's no work left to do. You already said the thing. The thing is liberals are crybabies, right? That hidden piece is already there. Um, what was I gonna say? I was gonna give an example here. Oh, like um, Hillary Clinton gave an example. She, uh, one of her writers wrote a, a joke for her that she told at a fundraising dinner, which was, um, most of us look at the Statue of Liberty and see justice and equity and whatever, promise. Donald Trump looks at the Statue of Liberty and sees a four. Which I was like, that's a very smart joke, right? Because number one, you need to know that Donald Trump had just gotten in trouble for these old recordings of him rating women on a scale of one to 10. You also have to know more broadly that he's accused of being a misogynist who's only interested in like, you know, what people look, what women look like. And it integrates the idea of this iconic structure that represents, you know, justice and openness and welcoming immigrants, which is Statue of Liberty, and puts it all in its head. So, but the audience has to do that, right? She never says, here are all the reasons why this joke makes sense. Mm -mm. The audience has to get that. See. There are several questions about what to do. <laughs> ah. Like, okay, so we have that. This is kind of a, a stalemate. You know, we have our uh, the, the ways and even aesthetics, you know, that kind of, and, and, you know, all, all those things that kind of negate a solution. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and do you have any kind of ideas on what do we do? Yeah. And, you know, so the, the book that I'm working on now is very much about understanding all these dynamics so that we can feel empowered to fix it. I think one of the things that's key is that our media environment and our political environment all operate in anticipation of what it is that they think we want. So if we change what we want, and if we change what we seek out, and if we change what we reward, the calculus of these media systems, of algorithms, of news producers, of Fox News producers, of politicians changes, right? So if you watch the Supreme Court nomination hearings today, you can tell our incentive structures are broken. There's just people up there using their 10 minutes to get a really sexy, juicy, outrageous clip that will be aired on cable news because it will be demanded by the viewers. So the question is, are there ways, you know, a, a lot of these sources are playing to the fringes. If you look at what's happened over the last 30 years, the percentage of independence in the United States has risen. So here we are talking about political polarization, right, which has happened. People are becoming more extreme, but there is this giant, giant collection of fair-minded people who want to be able to have spirited debate issue by issue, who are occupying this space. And many of them do have ideological leanings, either left or right. But I think that the more that we become aware of the forces that are trying to exploit our predilections, the more we can try to disrupt it ourselves, right? And some of the ways to do this, by the way, one way is I think we spend a lot of time thinking of ourselves in partisan terms. So many cues in our world remind us of our partisan identity bumper stickers, yard signs, right? Anything, um, gosh, whether or not you use a reusable water bottle or take herbal supplements, or if you're a vegetarian or you eat red meat or you drive a Prius, all of these things all have associations with partisanship. What if we try to cultivate spaces that dilute that, those associations, right? Cultivate spaces where our partisanship is not the most prominent thing in our minds. There have been experiments that show that if you get people to think about their role as like 
parents. All of a sudden, all of those reflexive responses rooted in partisan animosity start to subside. There's another way that we can do it too, which is through something that's called epistemic humility, which is just the notion that in, in, you know, the extent to which we recognize the limits of what we know and the limits of what we can know. And epistemic humility is associated with a reduction in belief in misinformation. It's also associated with more careful thinking. It's the people who are very confident in their knowledge who tend to be wrong the most. And there are ways to encourage epistemic humility. You know, there are exercises that you can do to get people thinking about the possibly the limits of what they know. I saw a question up here that talks about the scientific method and part of what is offered with the scientific method is an understanding of falsifiability or falsification. That is, we're not trying to prove ourselves right. As scientists, we are always trying to set ourselves up to prove ourselves wrong, right? Always, that's what we're trying to do. We're constantly trying to break our theories. Now, we never say that our theories have been proven, ever. We never remove ourselves from doubt because we never know if the world and the universe is gonna go upside down and that the theory will not hold tomorrow. We just don't know. So finding ways to reward epistemic humility, to teaching it and rewarding it. Right now, none of our spaces, our media spaces, our political spaces, humility, epistemic humility is like punished. Can you imagine someone who, who says, you know, this is my view, but I'm not sure because there could be more information that could come to light that would really, you know, contradict what I'm saying here right now. Do you see that on Fox News? Do you see that on CNN? It's never performed for us. Um, so I, I feel like there are ways. Yeah, that's that's so interesting. And and as a as a the university librarian, you know, it's like we we'd love to have the library as a space like that where uh, you know, like people are thinking about them as learning and then kind of this ongoing mode yeah. where you're uh, questioning the assumptions uh, you have. Yeah. Um, and and I'm kind of curious, you know, do, do you have an opinion about the role of those institutions and organizations like us, you know, the library and kind of promoting that you, you refer to those books that you, uh, you think are excellent read, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, I'd love to kind of think of, uh, you know, as a resource. But what about the kind of professional role, you know, do, do yeah. we... Yep. I think more than anything, I think that I think psychologists have approached all of these problems too much from from a standpoint of um, individual cognition and not recognizing the social nature of all of these problems. They're very social in nature and libraries are the perfect spaces to um, have programming that illustrates and models some of these approaches. Right. I have um, I work with the National Institute for Civil Discourse that does a lot of these kinds of, of programs. Well, they'll, they'll come out to town councils and um, public hearings and libraries to do trainings on how do you know, how do we talk to one another? How can you perform some of these different values, values like humility or civility that are not rewarded? are not even on display in our media spaces. So a huge, I think that there's a pivotal role to play in communities. Cool. Well, I think we're gonna end it uh, here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Danaga. It was so uh, interesting uh, and thought provoking. Uh, maybe next time you give us a, a stand up too. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, you know, uh, I also wanted to just remind whoever is still on uh, air uh, that we have this coming talk next week, uh, uh, April 6th, actually. Uh, so uh, please join us to, to this talk. Uh, it's gonna be as exciting, I hope. Uh, and thank you for uh, being with us and thinking about what we do. Uh, join our friends group, we need you around. 
uh, and uh, also uh, visit our libraries and uh, see you the next time. But thank you so much. And, and it, was, it was lovely to have you around. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks.